nearly 400 Americans heading home by plane, but back into isolation. Their new quarantine just beginning, but those already diagnosed with the virus won't be shipping out. The families separated this morning. Student death arrest, the 14-year-old behind bars accused of murdering college student Tessa Majors in a New York City park. This arrest is a major milestone on the path to justice. The evidence police say connects the teenager to the crime and what they say were the young woman's final words. State of emergency. Mississippi's governor making the declaration as rivers hit major flood stage. Boats navigating through waterlogged streets. More rain on the way. Plus the blast of cold air ready to sweep across the country. Royal revelations. Harry and Meghan spotted out and about as Canon Kate opens up about her challenges as a mom. Do you struggle with mum guilt? Yes, absolutely. Right. I think anyone who does <laughs> as a mother is actually like, <laughs> yeah, all the time. The rare glimpse inside the royal household. And basketball foul. The All-Star Slam Dunk Contest featuring epic moves. Celebrity judges ready to call it a tie, but then the surprise. Was there an assist here? Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. And good Sunday morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get right to our top story. The emergency evacuation of American citizens from a cruise ship quarantined in Japan. That ship had hundreds of cases of coronavirus on board. As we come on the air this morning, the evacuations are underway, but the Americans on board are really not out of the woods yet. Even after enduring, enduring nearly two weeks of quarantine, they're now looking at two more weeks in isolation when they reach American soil. As you might imagine, some of those passengers say they are deeply frustrated. A few even telling us they'd rather stay behind. Cases of the virus reaching 68,000 worldwide across 24 countries with more than 1,600 deaths nearly all in China and a new one reported this morning outside of the country in Taiwan. ABC's Maggie Ruley is right there in Yokohama, Japan with the very latest. Maggie, good morning. Good morning, Eva. Yeah, just behind this gate, there are about a dozen buses lined up, ready and waiting for all of those Americans, finally getting them off of this boat where they've been in quarantine now for nearly two weeks. There's a charter flight waiting to take them back to the United States as well. But guys, tonight is just the start of their very long journey. This morning, buses now arriving at the port as Japan's self-defense forces prepare to disembark hundreds of quarantined American passengers from the Diamond Princess before they're flown back to the U.S. on State Department chartered planes. Members of the defense force could be seen walking past the troubled ship. The roughly 400 Americans on board have already been in quarantine for 12 days. But back in the States, the clock restarts with another 14 days in isolation on U.S. military bases. The CDC first screening all Americans for the virus. Anyone with signs of COVID-19 will not be allowed to board planes back to the U.S. and will join the other Americans currently getting treatment in hospitals on shore. For many, this evacuation cannot come soon enough. As of today, another 70 passengers on board tested positive for the virus, bringing the total number to 355, by far the largest cluster of COVID-19 outside of China. But some, like Matthew Smith of Sacramento, say he would rather take his chances on the boat. We were confident in the quarantine that the Japanese officials have established and are following through on. We were upset that the U.S. plans involved breaking this quarantine. The U.S. government says Americans like Matt, who choose to stay behind, will not be allowed back in the U.S. until March 4th at the earliest, as the U.S. tries to prevent an outbreak like China. With protective gear in short supply around the globe, ABC News got an exclusive look inside this 3M factory in South Dakota, where employees are working overtime. Some U.S. hospitals are already rationing masks. The CDC says they're working with U.S. manufacturers to help meet the global demand while ensuring an adequate supply here at home in case of a widespread outbreak. Japanese authorities say that for everyone who stays behind on this boat, if they test negative and if they haven't come into close contact with someone who has the virus, they could be ready to disembark as early as Wednesday. But guys, remember for Americans like Matthew who stay behind, even if they test negative, they're still not going to be allowed back into the United States for at least two weeks. And even that is not guaranteed. 
Eva. All right, Maggie, thank you. Now to the arrest in the death of murdered college student Tessa Majors here in New York City, which made headlines across the country. Police revealing what led them to the suspect, who is just 14 years old, now being charged as an adult. Stephanie Ramos has more from the park where it happened. Good morning to you, Stephanie. Eva, good morning. A makeshift memorial is still set up here to remember 18 year old Tessa Majors, who was targeted and fatally stabbed here. Police say this new arrest in the case won't bring Tessa home to her family, but will hopefully bring them some justice. Two months after the fatal stabbing of New York City Barnard College freshman Tessa Majors, we are confident that we have the person in custody who stabbed her. The NYPD announcing they've arrested 14-year-old Rayshawn Weaver for his role in the grisly crime in Manhattan's Morningside Park. Authorities say DNA evidence, smartphone evidence, witness identification, and the defendant's own statements led them to charge Weaver as an adult under state law on two counts of murder in the second degree. According to the criminal complaint, on December 11th, video surveillance shows Majors entering the park just before 7 that evening. That's when Weaver and two other teens who entered the park from a different location set their sights on Majors, allegedly trying to rob her of her cell phone. There's going to be an 80 female white stand at this time. Police say Majors tried to fight back, even leaving one of her attackers with bite marks. Some of the last words she was known to have said was, help me. I'm being robbed. Her death triggering a massive two week manhunt. A 13 year old alleged accomplice in custody since the day after the killing faces a felony murder charge. Weaver, who was wanted for questioning in the weeks after the killing, ran away as he was being taken in, but later submitted to an interview and a DNA test. This arrest is a major milestone on the path to justice for Tessa Majors. Weaver has not filed a plea, but if convicted, faces 15 years to life in prison. Police say he was arrested Friday night while at home with his family. He did not resist arrest. His attorney has not commented on the case. Wit. It's a terribly upsetting case all around. Stephanie Ramos for us. Thank you. We do want to turn now to politics and the battle for Nevada. Candidates are stumping hard, getting ready for a debate on Wednesday with the caucus now less than one week away. ABC's Rachel Scott is following all the action from Las Vegas for us. Rachel, good morning to you. Wig, good morning. Nearly 12,000 Nevada Democrats turning out on the first day of early voting. The candidates fighting to get ahead in this state and only have six days left to make their case. In Nevada, the sprint to the first contest in the West. Former Vice President Joe Biden packing in events. Senator, thank you very much. And challenging his rivals on health care, making his pitch to union workers. Some Democrats want to get rid of it. Well, my, over my dead body, they're going to get rid of it. Medicare for all requires you to give it up. My plan allows you to keep what you've negotiated. Senator Bernie Sanders taking heat from some union leaders who are warning against his proposal for Medicare for all. We are going to pass a Medicare for all single payer program. But the senator telling me he is not worried about losing momentum. We have about 700 people marching at the vote. We're feeling absolutely great. The candidates fanning out across the state now six days out from the Nevada caucuses. Senator Amy Klobuchar speaking at a Black History Month festival, hoping her message breaks through to minority voters. Why should they give your campaign a chance? Well, I need to get to know them because um, my name ID wasn't very high, uh, my bank account not as big, and so it's on me now to share with people my record. Skipping this state, former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, the billionaire bringing out hundreds in Virginia, but facing growing criticism. The Washington Post reporting on allegations of sexism at his company, as reported recently by ABC News. His spokesperson responding, saying Mike simply does not tolerate any kind of discrimination or harassment. And Bloomberg has just two days left to qualify for the next debate. But as the rest of the field makes their final push here in Nevada, they will have to share the spotlight with President Trump. The president will be holding a rally right here in Las Vegas just one day before the caucuses. Dan? Rachel, thank you. Let's get some perspective now from Martha Raditz, who's in Washington, where she'll be hosting this week later this morning. Martha, good morning. I want to start with these Bloomberg allegations. He's starting to get a lot more scrutiny as his poll numbers spike. Uh, do you think these, uh, these stories, these older stories of alleged sexism are, are likely to halt that rise? 
Well, well, first of all, this was a very deep dive into those allegations by the Washington Post, and there were some alarming things reported in that Washington Post article. So I think he will get more scrutiny after this. Whether it affects him, Dan, it's anyone's guess. Uh, he is very aggressive. Uh, they look at Mike Bloomberg, those voters who are supporting him, as someone who could take on Donald Trump, and Donald Trump has certainly had allegations in the past, and not just allegations, but uh, a very sexist talk, talk, as we all remember, on that Access Hollywood uh, tape. So whether this sticks to Mike Bloomberg, we, we just don't know at this point, Dan, but he will definitely be getting more scrutiny about this. I think there's no question about that. So we've got Nevada coming up in six days. Uh, Bloomberg not on the ballot there. Who has the most on the line in Nevada? Well, I, I think you've got people like Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar coming out of those strong showings uh, in, in New Hampshire, especially. But those are very, very white states, New Hampshire and Iowa. And they go into Nevada. There's a 30 percent Latino electorate there, 10 percent black. They have got to make some inroads. You heard Amy Klobuchar there in Rachel Scott's uh, piece saying, look, people just don't know my name. It's how they're going to get to know those uh, Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg that's very important for them and they have very little time to make that happen before they go into Nevada and then into South Carolina. All right, six days to, to boost their name ID in Nevada and as you said, South Carolina one week after that. I know you've been spending some time on the ground in South Carolina. What are you learning there? Well, I, I think, first of all, we all know that Joe Biden says this is kind of a make-or-break state. It's his firewall, uh, he says, in South Carolina. I found the support there for, for Joe Biden really pretty strong and holding. He's got lots of uh, people on the ground and supporters going out to try to raise money and to try to raise voter awareness about Biden. But others are coming on strong as well. And, and Pete Buttigieg uh, and Amy Klobuchar and the surprise, Tom Stein. But Tom Steyer has put so much money into South Carolina, but he's also done a lot of FaceTime. And for those voters, for those minority voters, particularly in South Carolina, that is very, very important. Another billionaire in the race, Tom Steyer. Martha Raddatz, thank you so much. And I want to remind everybody, tune in, please, to This Week, later this morning. Martha will go one-on-one -on -one with Democratic presidential candidates Amy Klobuchar and the aforementioned Tom Steyer. Plus, the powerhouse roundtable debates the latest in the 2020 race. And and, of course, the fallout from the ABC News exclusive interview with Attorney General Bill Barr a few days ago. That's all coming up on this week. And another reminder while I have you, check out the round-the-clock coverage of politics and much more on our new streaming channel, ABC News Live. Eva, over to you. Well, now the new details we're learning about a football brawl may have breaking out after a fight between Miles Garrett of the Cleveland Browns and Mason Rudolph of the Pittsburgh Steelers in November. For the first time, Garrett is opening up about what he says happened as he is reinstated from his suspension. ABC Zachary Keish is here with more. Good morning, Zachary. Eva, good morning to you as well. It was one of the worst fights we've ever seen on the field. 33 players were disciplined. Now, for the first time since that incident, Miles Garrett the guy at the center of it all is talking and despite what he says preempted the fight he wants to apologize and take accountability this morning miles garrett is opening up the league hit the cleveland browns defensive end with an indefinite suspension after this fight with steelers quarterback mason rudolph in an espn interview garrett says what he heard sparked something inside of him let's go to take him down he says some words as we're going down what did he say to you I mean, he called me the N-word. He called me a stupid N-word. Rudolph has said the allegations are a bold-faced lie, adding, this is a disgusting and reckless attempt to assassinate my character. Rudolph's team is threatening legal action. The NFL saying in a statement, we looked into the matter and found no such evidence. The shocking moment that got Garrett suspended cost him the last six games of the season in over a million dollars in pay. I apologize. No, there's no need for that kind of violence. No, that was outside of the game of football. And uh, it was idiotic, foolish. No, it, it was childish on both parts, but it was childish of, of me. And you know, what I did was wrong, and what I, I got what I deserved. The league fined the Browns and Steelers $250,000 each, both players admitting they should have handled the situation differently. Should have done a better job of keeping my cool in that situation. 
Again, Garrett has been reinstated, which means we expect to see him back on the field this year. But the NFL also said in their statement there was no sound recorded from the field, which uh, makes it hard to understand if we will ever truly know exactly what happened out there. Still raises a lot of questions, but he's but Garrett is apologizing and accepting responsibility. He's owning up. Uh, he's taking accountability yeah. and uh, in many ways trying to turn the page, I think. Yeah. All right, Zachary, thank you. Thank you, guys. We do want to turn now to the shocking takedown of a teenager at a North Carolina hospital. He's seen being thrown to the ground on surveillance video. This morning, his mother is talking about what happened. ABC's Trevor Alt has more. It's shocking security footage capturing a North Carolina teen slammed by a security guard and punched by a sheriff's deputy. But this morning, it's the teen who's facing charges. Jessica Long said she'd taken her 16-year-old son Hayden to the hospital because he was in the midst of a mental health crisis. I was still thinking these men will help. Their, their goal will be to help me help my son. And they they didn't do that. Hospital footage obtained by the family's attorney shows Hayden shoving his mom as she waves for help. A security guard then pushing the teen down twice, pulling a stun gun. And as Hayden walks back to the car, a second security guard grabs him by the neck and tackles him from behind, leaving Hayden bleeding. When deputies arrive, things escalate even further. Authorities claiming Hayden spit blood in the face of Deputy Justin Polson, who responds by punching the handcuffed teen twice in the head. Sheriff Bill Beam has defended Deputy Polson, claiming he had a reaction to a felonious assault. And despite the video the sheriff told WBTV earlier this week, Deputy Polson didn't punch the teen, saying, All I saw was once and he was pushing him back away. No, he did not punch him in the face. But the sheriff's office now tells ABC News Deputy Polson is no longer employed with the Lincoln County Sheriff's Office. 16-year-old Hayden is now facing multiple charges, including felony assault of a law enforcement officer. His mother says she was just trying to get him help. I took him to an emergency room, and he was treated like a criminal by everybody. Nobody ever treated him like a patient. Well, Hayden's first court appearance is set for this week, and his mother is hoping with this video release the charges will be dropped. And that is possible, but there's also a possibility he'll be charged as an adult. His mother says they're always told if uh, there's a mental health emergency, you should reach out, and then this happens. Yeah, mental illness is such a huge challenge in this country, yeah. and often law enforcement doesn't quite know what to do. Right. Trevor, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. We're going to switch gears now and get it over to Robert Marciano, who's got a look at the, the weather, including some uh, flooding in the south. Yeah, we talked about this yesterday, and it's still happening. Unfortunately, they pushed back the crest of the Pearl River in Jackson, Mississippi, until Tuesday now. And this is fresh video coming into us now. 38 feet is the forecast crest, and we're almost there. That's the worst flooding they've seen since 1983. The Big Black River is in record flood stage. And we have a little bit of rain this morning across parts of the south, but mostly south of that area, just now through Jackson. So that'll dry out, at least for now and this will get into northern Florida later on today. There's another storm coming into the Pacific Northwest that drops into the plains on Monday. Rain and snow, uh, Chicago rain, mostly snow north of Milwaukee and another batch of rain across Jackson. That flooded area, maybe one to two inches of rainfall on Tuesday as this gets into the nor northeast and then some cold air coming in behind this. But this is certainly not what they need later on this week. That's a check on the national weather time now for a look at your local forecast. Well, hello and good morning, Washington. We're 15 to 20 degrees warmer this morning, and it'll be much milder this afternoon as well. Fair amount of clouds for uh, your Sunday, 50 degrees. For President's Day on Monday, a lot more sunshine. Temperatures still on the mild side, 52. Going ahead through early next week, 58 degrees on your Tuesday. Cold front, that'll shift through the region late. Chance for a few showers, I think, mainly closer to the evening commute and thereafter. 47 on Wednesday, back in the upper 30s on Thursday. You are correct, Dan Harris. The Daytona 500 is today. They might be a couple of showers there in North Florida as they start off. Yeah, I, said, I said something about the Daytona 500. You sure did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 sure did. He'll be there with a tall boy. Yeah. 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 Getting her done. Yeah. yeah. That's how I'll be spending my Sunday. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and here's how I didn't spend my Saturday. There was apparently a slam dunk contest yesterday. It was spectacular. Yeah. If you weren't watching, you should have been. One high flying dunk after the next, but the ending, not what really anyone expected. Man, this is incredible. Ready for it. Over oh. between the legs. Whoa. The 2020 NBA All-Star Slam Dunk Contest is being called one of the greatest of all time. With 
10 perfect dunks. However, this morning, NBA players and fans are calling foul with the score even. Let it go, man. It's a tie. And down to the final dunk, everyone was ready to call this one a tie. It's a tie. It should be a tie. That's when the night's biggest surprise came from the judges. 